Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bob Bruner, and I am the Exotic Forest Pest Educator with Purdue University's Department of Entomology. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a rather unique insect that is beginning to invade North America and damage some of our eastern hemlock trees, the hemlock woolly adelgid. This insect is of some concern to our hemlocks. They're a valuable tree that we love to plant ornamentally, and they're just kind of beautiful in nature. They're one of our tallest, most long-lived trees that we have. So we have a vested interest in protecting them. So why don't we go ahead and dive right into what we're going to be focusing on right now. So hemlock woolly adelgid is kind of related to aphids and cicadas and other sap-sucking insects that we see pretty regularly. This one has a few unique traits to it. One of the ones that sticks out the most, perhaps, is its tendency to create this waxy secretion that gives it its name. Sometimes these are referred to as pine aphids, and they do resemble aphids a little bit, but they are a part of a completely different family. They're just distantly related to aphids. They are invasive, they are native to Asia, um, and they are not as great a concern in their native range, really, but unfortunately they do a significant amount of damage to hemlocks here on the Western Hemisphere. So one of the things that I like to start off with is making sure that we know how to identify the tree that we're going to be talking about. And what I'm going to focus on right now are our eastern hemlock trees. This is the tree that we're going to be the most concerned about within the North American area. So I love these trees. I think that they're gorgeous. They are an evergreen tree. They are very long lived. Some of them can live as long as uh, 900 or more years. The oldest one that's ever been recorded is 988 years old. So they don't reach maturity until several centuries have gone by. Um, they do cover a significant portion of the continental United States, and we have plenty of hemlock here in Indiana. We just typically see a landscape dominated by oak and maple. But if you check around your neighborhood, if you check around a lot of wood stands, you're going to find hemlocks. There's one probably within 20 feet of where I'm talking right now. They're able to grow very, very large. Uh, the largest one ever recorded had an 84 inch diameter, which is absolutely massive. And it reached a height of 160 feet. Um, that is nearly unheard of in a lot of areas of the United States. That kind of gives you an idea that this tree is really just a special kind of tree. Now the thing is, residentially, we tend to plant dwarf hemlocks, so obviously we're not going to see them get that large. But they still make up a valuable portion of our landscape, and we tend to love them. So they are members of the pine family, so that means that they do produce cones. That is going to be their primary way of seeding. But the cones they produce will only contain a single seed, and they're going to have a kind of papery texture. They also have branches that tend to droop. So if you ever have the opportunity to look around for evergreens, if you see those with that telltale drooping kind of look to them, you're probably looking at an eastern hemlock. They do require well-drained soils, but they need some moisture and acidity. Um, there are plenty of places within Indiana that actually fit that bill. Now, unfortunately, they tend to favor cooler summers. They do not tolerate drought well without management. In the last few years, we've been getting drought or near drought conditions plenty of times. So a lot of our eastern hemlock are going to need a lot of care to be able to keep moving. Uh, now, when, like I mentioned before, when you're talking about a home landscape, if you're wanting hemlock, you're probably planting a dwarf variety. Uh, let's face it, I have yet to see anybody plant a tree that's reaching that kind of height within the area in which I live, but you never know. And it's just going to make it far easier to manage if you plant a dwarf variety of this tree. Now, when it comes to identification, I've already mentioned a few things that you can use to identify them to make it easy on you. I mentioned the drooping branches, the kind of papery cones. Um, you can also use their needles, much like any other pine. So we often identify pines, like white pines or red pines, by the needle arrangement within the petiole as they attach to the tree. Now hemlocks, you don't really need to worry so much about that. Individual needles will have an attachment point that's pretty simplistic compared to the needles on another pine tree. But what you can look for is look for these kind of dull, round-edged needles that have a white line on the bottom of them. That white line are the stomata of that needle, meaning the openings that that leaf uses to perform respiration and gas exchanges and release moisture or take it in. Uh, the bark on eastern hemlock initially starts out gray and smooth, and it will become scaly, turning a reddish-brown as its life goes on. 
And like I mentioned before, the cones are papery. They're fairly small. They're very tiny. You would look at them and think they're kind of like a very immature pine cone, but they're not. And they only contain a single seed. Now these pictures really do tell the whole story on how you can most easily identify them. Um, the cones there, they're going to be smaller than a cone that you would kind of imagine on a pine tree, but the needles are extremely easy to identify. You're looking at the underside of the needles on that right hand image there, and you can see there's an obvious white line, and that is a very, very reliable trait to identify these. And you can see that the needles are very, very round. They're not pointy at all. Now the hard part. Let's identify the hemlock woolly adelgid. I say hard part, but it does have some easy traits you can use. This image really does tell you. You can see those white, woolly-looking little things attached at the base of each needle. Those are the presence of either an egg mass, or at least the waxy secretions left behind by an adult adelgid. So, if you try to find the actual insect itself, you're in for a challenge. They're very tiny, they're difficult to see with the naked eye. I would recommend a hand lens, even for someone like me who's been looking at bugs for quite a while now. The infestation is most easily identified by those wool-like egg masses that you're always going to find at the base of a needle, and that's important. If they're anywhere else, you're probably not talking about an adelgid. These are always at the base of the needle. Um, and they will typically favor the underside, and sometimes you may find them on the stems of the plants itself. Now, like I said before, these do resemble aphids, so that means they're going to use piercing, sucking mouth parts to be able to feed on the tree. And they're going to have this kind of grazing behavior where they're not going to move around a whole lot. They're just going to feed, and once they're done feeding in one location, they move around a little bit. Now, one of the more unique aspects of this insect is that they do share a trait with aphids in that they have different body forms that have different purposes. And what that means is that different generations that happen within a year are going to have different names, they're going to behave very, very differently, and it's going to be based on the time of year and whether they're about to go into their overwintering phase or not. One key thing about the hemlock woolly adelgid is that some of those different body forms, some of those different generations, can't survive in North America. The host plant they need either isn't present or it's unsuitable in this environment. So we're only going to see a few of these, and I'm going to go over them. Now here are just a few pictures, and I do apologize for the graininess in the image. Like I said, these insects are very, very small, and they're very difficult to see. In the top left, you can see that's an egg mass being covered by those white woolly secretions that gives the name. In the top right, you can see a flighted adelgid adult that belongs to a generation known as sexupare or sexuales. Essentially, these are capable of sexual reproduction. Most adelgids are actually going to reproduce reproduced through parthenogenesis, which means they create a daughter clone without needing a mate. The bottom left image is showing you some adult adelgids that are probably going about laying their eggs, whereas the bottom right is showing you the immature form, namely called crawlers, and those are all, all at the base of the needles. Remember, those are the base of those needles of a hemlock, so those are very, very tiny. So let's start now just kind of mapping out what each generation of the adelgid is going to look like. And we're going to start out with a generation that's called cystins at the top of this image you see. And this is going to be the overwintering generation of this insect. Now cystins, like I said, overwinters and they only exist between June and March. And during that period of time, for the most part, they're actually not going to really feed. Uh, during the warmer months, they're going to go into a state that's called estivation, where they have extremely low activity levels. Think of it kind of like hibernation for a bear, except in this case, it's during the summer. Once we begin to get past the summer months and we get into the later fall, they're going to become active and start feeding and start developing more until eventually they become adults in the spring and they produce a new generation that's called the progredians generation. And if we go back to our little chart here of generations, we can see that the progredians exist during the summer. Now this one behaves just like cystins, except it is extremely tr truncated. All the time, all the development is smushed together. And it's entirely smushed together from March to June, or arguably April to July. It depends on what your environmental conditions are. Um, but the big take home thing is it's essentially cystins accelerated much faster. They do not have any diapause. They don't need to worry about surviving winter. They just exist during the early or late spring and summer. And just like cystins, they will be entirely female. Both these generations produce daughter clones. They do not mate sexually. They will reproduce asexually by giving birth to clones of themselves. 
Now progredians, as it moves towards the end of the summer, will reproduce, and it's either going to produce a new generation that it cystins, their overwintering form, or a generation known as sexupare, which is a form that's intended for migration. And you can see here that migration of these guys will be born towards the winter and then they're going to migrate. Now there is a little bit of a, of a thing with the sexupare. They are not capable of being successful in North America. Now these insects, they are winged, they are capable of reproducing sexually, but they use spruce as their primary host plant. However, native spruce in North America is not a plant they can be successful on. And we've even found that the spruce that they need from their home range, if you transplant it here in North America, they still can't be successful on them. Now that doesn't mean we don't see sexupare, they're still produced. Progredians will still produce them during the summer, and sometimes you will see evidence of mass migrations of them, but they don't survive to create anything. Only the, the cystins will be able to survive it in the next generation. There's also a fourth form called sexuales, but that one exists in its native range. It lacks the plants to be able to be successful here, so we don't worry about those in North America. So what are we going to see? when hemlock woolly adelgid really does its damage. Well, the image on the right shows you one thing. You can see all of those little woolly white secretions, those egg masses stuck to the bottoms of the leaves there. But we can also see that there is going to be damage to the hemlock tree itself in the image on the left. So they are feeding, in, they are insects that feed using piercing sucking mouth parts or a rostrum. And that means that they are draining sap out of a plant. That sap contains nutrients and other things the plant needs to develop. So the loss of that material is going to impact the plant's health no matter what. The damage will progress just like a heavy aphid infestation on any other tree that you might see. However, the hemlock doesn't have a good defense against its invaders, so that damage is just going to be ongoing. You're going to see branch dieback and other associated damage from feeding, such as potential disease entry into the trees themselves. And then there's just some structural damage where you're going to see lots of potential sap bleeding and other things as the tree is, has open wounds on it, essentially. But this feeding damage will be based on the temperature and the existing moisture. The drier it is, the harder the time the insect may have being successful. However, if it gets too cool, uh, the insect will then go shut down, so it kind of needs a little bit of a sweet spot. Ideally, if the, the warmer the insect is, the more damage you're going to see to the tree. So like I mentioned here, we're going to see branch dieback as one symptom. However, this will typically progress from the lower branches upwards. You'll also see, as infestations progress further and further, that needle drop and reduced regrowth is going to occur. So the tree will attempt to regrow from its losses, but it won't be very successful. Now the easiest symptom to find, as I mentioned already, are those little white filaments, those little woolly masses at the base of the needles. I wouldn't try to find the insects themselves unless you know what you're doing. They're just going to be too hard to locate. Instead, look for those masses and make sure they're at the base of the needles. Sometimes these can be confused for scales. Now scales are insects as well, and they feed in the same way, but not many scale species are going to do the level of damage to a hemlock that the hemlock woolly adelgid is capable of. Now what are some of the ultimate results of this? Infestations could potentially kill a tree in as little as four years, though I believe we typically see trees survive between five and eight years after an infestation starts. Like I mentioned earlier, the warmer it is, it's going to make the insect be able to do its work faster, and it's going to be able to let the insect produce more of itself, so that way populations will grow quicker. But the good thing is, is that extreme cold will kill the overwintering insects. Unfortunately, we've been getting some mild winters lately, so we may not get that benefit, but we'll see how that's going to play out. So how do we begin to manage this? Well, first off, we need to manage the health of our tree just overall. Um, the healthier the tree is, the better it's going to be able to survive infestation. We also need to make sure that we assess that health and we assess the tree for any um, potential treatment success after infestation, which can be a big challenge with this because those waxy white filaments will remain even after treatment has been successful and over time they'll just kind of fall off. So we don't have real good clear signs beyond hopefully the tree getting healthier. 
Um, we do have options that are a combination of biocontrol, insecticides, and non-target plant replanting should you lose trees. But we really need to see, is a tree worth saving? Think of this kind of like our emerald ash borer infestation. You need to do triage. Some of these trees are not going to be worth rescuing. Now, in terms of biocontrol, this is considered one of the best alternatives to an insecticidal treatment. This is still in the research phase, though. There are no native North American species that will attack a hemlock woolly adelgid. However, there are several candidates from its home range that are currently being evaluated, including some predatory beetles, silver flies, and more. Um, it's going to be some time. We take a lot of effort to evaluate potential insects like this because we don't want to release something that itself will become a problem. So we'll have to be patient with this one. We do have a lot of insecticidal options and application methods available to us, though most of them come down to using either imidacloprid or dinotefrin. And usually we're going to be using them in the form of some kind of systemic, so either a soil drench, an injection, however you may also see options for foliar sprays and basal bark sprays. You can also use insecticidal soaps, but that generally only works for crawlers. It only works for those immature stages of that insect. So, and those can be hard to see. So you'll have to time that very carefully if you choose that route. Now, what can we do before this insect really starts hitting us hard? So it's not here in Indiana yet. We suspect it will arrive soon. So what you need to do now is check the condition of all your hemlock trees. And again, you need to focus on the idea that not all the trees are going to be saved. Figure out which ones are the healthiest and then invest in those trees. Report any sightings of this to uh, websites like EdMaps, Gledden, or you can contact Indiana DNR or Purdue Extension. I've also got my contact information at the end of this. And don't worry if you're not sure. Go ahead and report it. Send us pictures. Tell us where you were. Tell us uh, what was going on with the tree. Even if it's not an infestation, we still want to know about it, just in case. So up here, I've got some contact information for all of you. You can call 1-866-NO-EXOTIC to report these things. You can also look up our different resources on different social media, and you can email me at rfbruner at purdue.edu. And with that, I want to thank all of you for your time, and I will see you at the next one.